Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Freddie Silva, who is a best-selling author and a leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. Hello to all of you. To say that I'm excited to share this next podcast guest and this podcast, which I've titled Universe, Christ, and Man with Freddie Silva, would be a very big understatement. I've been studying Freddie Silva's many documentaries and enjoying his guest appearances on a variety of different shows on Gaia TV and others, and have read two of his excellent books. Most recently, I've completed his book, The Divine Blueprint, which was very good. He's also a regular contributor to the most excellent series titled Ancient Civilizations on Gaia. And for any of you that are interested in ancient civilizations, this show is badass. It is loaded with great, highly intelligent experts, revealing a lot you do not find through standard academic channels. Freddie Silva's vast knowledge of history, archaeology, anthropology, dowsing, temple building, sacred geometry, the history of world religions and ancient texts, his grasp of many languages, and his willingness to travel the world to seek out people in native cultures with historical knowledge of events on earth and much more makes him a very unique highly educated and informed man. In this podcast, I took the opportunity to ask Freddie some of my most pressing big questions based on my many years of studying these types of subjects. Some of the questions I asked him are, what is the actual nature and structure of the universe based on his research? What is the nature of human beings? Are we a hybrid of chimpanzees mixed with the DNA of extraterrestrial visitors, often referred to as gods in sacred texts? Why are human beings here? How were the Egyptian temples really built? These concepts of temples being built with stones being rolled up wooden rollers by slaves as taught in universities is an absolute joke. I work with big rocks all the time, and when, when you're trying to move a hundred-ton block of stone, it'll crush a tree like a marshmallow. So there's a lot more going on here, and Freddie and I get into that. Are there actually cyclical periods in which souls are harvested as suggested in the Law of One by Ra. And one of my juiciest questions I've been dying to ask him for quite some time, was Jesus an actual man, or is he a cooked-up personification of a myth by the Catholic Church? You'll be very surprised at Freddie's answer. I know I sure was. Though Freddie was on a time budget, we packed a lot of very interesting information and addressed a lot of deep questions carried by most intelligent people worldwide. I hope you enjoy learning from Freddie Silva as much as I did. This is an amazing conversation with Freddie Silva, so get ready. You might want to have a notebook handy. He's fun, he's funny, and he is wickedly smart. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. For the last 90 days, I've been testing out my new Juve lights. And one of the things that they're very good at is reducing inflammation in the body, which, as you know, is a major problem worldwide due to a number of factors from stress to diet to toxins in the environment to electromagnetic pollution. But isn't it amazing that with Juve, you can actually decrease your overall inflammation easily? And I've got Wes Feifner from Juve to explain to us exactly how that happens. Wes, how does Juve decrease inflammation in the body? So, Paul, it, it's, it's pretty simple. What Juve does is it provides healing wavelengths of light of red and near infrared in a non-invasive way to your body. And what it does is it supercharges your mitochondria to produce more energy. And when your body has more energy, it can help naturally support the inflammation process in your body. So that's beautiful. So it's not some kind of chemical trickery or electromagnetic trickery. It's really just supporting your natural systems with frequencies that the body can use to energize and heal itself. It's exactly right. It's natural and it's what you would get out in sunlight. Beautiful. Well, I know the smaller units run around $445 and you can get the big full deal. So your whole body's getting hit for $8,500. What's the listening discount for Living 4D listeners and how do they get their amazing Juve lights? So if you're interested in checking out the Juve products, head over to juve.com, J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash check and use code check 50 to save $50 on your first purchase. Enjoy your Juve lights. I love them. Hello, everybody. All of us at the Czech Institute are excited about our new golf performance specialist online training program, 
I developed the Golf Performance Specialist Program myself because there was no program in the world that offered a holistic, integrated approach to assessing the golf athlete and getting them balanced, healthy, and performing better. Through my career as a rehabilitation and performance specialist, I've worked with a long string of golfers that were injured and suffering performance plateaus that weren't getting results until I applied the integrated holistic approach I share in the Golf Performance Specialist Program, which teaches you how to customize your programs to each individual's needs. Most of them caught in the traditional mindset of trying to adjust swing faults by modifying their stance or buying new golf clubs only spent thousands of dollars that didn't help their game. But after applying the principles and practices I teach in this program, came to fully realize that it's the golf athlete that plays the game, not the club. Not only does having this specialized training give you the skills to work with some of the most commonly injured athletes and enthusiasts, it gives you access to millions of people that have the finances to afford your expertise. Regardless if you're a physician treating sports injuries, a physical therapist, chiropractor, osteopath, massage therapist, conditioning specialist, or a player that wants to optimize performance, this course teaches you key assessments and how to address common muscle imbalance syndromes, identify and activate inhibited muscles, optimize core function, and clearly shows you how to progress the player through the essential stages of flexibility, stability, strength, and power development. To order your e-learning course now, go to checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. I know you're going to enjoy this course. It's very powerful, very holistic, and it works extremely well. Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable, and I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. So to get access to this complex, all you have to do is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15 at checkout. That's lowercase C-H-E-K 15 and you can save 15% off. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very special guest, somebody I've really wanted to interview for a long time, and he was gracious enough to give us an hour of his time. That's Freddie Silva. Freddie, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. Yes, where are you, Freddie? Portland, Maine. Oh, okay, cool. We're in San Diego. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Um, Freddie, you're fairly well known out there but just for the listeners um i would just start by introducing you by saying you're one of these guys that they call a polymath you seem to have the most <laughs> wild grasp on everything from dousing to deep spirituality to the mathematics of temples i, I i've never met anyone or studied anyone that can speak so damn many languages how many languages do you know <laughs> <laughs> and COVID only made it worse by sitting at home and learning about more things. I'm now studying dead languages uh, <laughs> for my next project. Um, no, I mean, it really comes from just being very curious and having the time to give up my career to do this full time. And, you know, and you pay the dues for many years, you don't make any money, you go bankrupt. But now, years <laughs> later, it's all coming back. You know, it's, it's paying off. And uh, yes, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, you have to put the effort into learning and learning from people who really know what they're doing. There's a lot of rubbish out there and a lot of filler. Yeah. I like to sort of spend the time looking for people who really understand what they've done. And that means people who've taken the time over years to understand that 
uh, a subject in its very greatest depth. So I'm kind of following their footsteps and following their method. And then I develop my own stuff over time because of my experiences as they build up. So, yeah, after a while, you realize, you you know, you probably have to move out of your uh, apartment because you realize it's, it's just too many books, which is just out of sight here. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to live on the deck somewhere because there's no more space. But, uh, yeah, you do, uh, you know, one door leads to 50. So, like I said, I... Um, I, I don't have a girlfriend, so I guess it kind of helps. <laughs> well, be careful because when you least expect it, that's when that one shows up. Uh, boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, right to my left is about a half a million dollars worth of books. And I too went through bankruptcy and now I too am getting the returns of 37 years of hard work. So you and I are cruising together. We I'm, speak many languages. <laughs> uh, I speak, uh, English and spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that covers quite a few. Yeah. I'm curious, Freddie, you must be, you and I must be similar ages. How old are you? Well, I stopped counting after 39, so I'm 39 plus 20. Okay. Yeah. You and I are the same age. I'm 59. I'll be 60 this summer. Oh, my God. I can't even think about it. Yeah. We also have the same barber. Uh, yes. We call it skin colored hair. Yeah, uh, I, apparently ladies find it very dignified, but I still, uh, I, I, I'm looking back at pictures of me when I was a, a budding rock star back in the uh, 80s, and uh, I had hair down to here. And I, I have to say, I don't care how much women find this very sexy, I've still, it hasn't sunk in yet. Yeah. You know, there's, something, there's something tactile about touching hair, you know, Well, and, and very sacred as well. Grass doesn't grow on a busy street, Freddie. Oh, yes, apparently. <laughs> I guess we should stop reading. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And studying and meditating and all the other things that <laughs> we have to do to authenticate our knowledge. You know, of the many programs and books and things I've studied of you, which is quite a lot, I can't find anything on your educational background. I'm curious, what what is your education background? That was my thought when I was hearing you on all these shows develop showing all these different skills i'm like well what the hell did he study to get started off <laughs> uh heavy drinking <laughs> uh, rock and roll um, i i really come from uh actually i mean if you go back to pr primary school i was a big uh, history teacher uh history fanatic and i had the best the best teacher in the world and he uh instilled with me the idea that if you want to know about something you've got to go back at least a hundred years to find out the cause of what we see affecting us every day. And of course, that opens up a whole can of worms because you, you end up, for example, uh, and this is back when I was 12, by the way, the first day of history lesson, he says, right, who started the Second World War? And of course, you will put your hand up, you know, the usual suspect, and he goes, really? And then when he says that, you go, well, now that you say it that way, I'm not so sure. And he gives you a stack of books and says, read this. And in a week, I want you to come back. So, of course, you have no play time. Come back and let me know what you think. And then you realize, actually, you need to, you need to look at things from a different perspective wherever you go. And uh, so history was one of my biggest uh, things in school. Um, architecture, uh, sacred architecture as well, art. Uh, and I really want to become a rock musician. Um, I wasn't allowed to, so I went into art school. I became a graphic designer, advertising. And you may think, what has this got to do with anything that I do right now? Well, actually, it has a lot to do because in advertising, I had to sell a product to a skeptical public and I had right. to condense a lot of marketing detail into a, a poster, which is usually a, a visual or a headline. And now I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm taking a visual, like a hieroglyph or a, a headline, a, a phrase in some sacred book, and I have to extract the information to create a book or a documentary and then i still have to send the skeptical public so actually it was great training because i learn everything as i go uh i don't have a formal training in physics or archaeology or history for that matter but i look at this at the books that i need to and the information i need from a non-judgmental and non-regulatory point of view which means i have access to go and free associate as i want uh, and that's a big distinction from being in a university environment. Uh, and I do have a degree, by the way, in the art, design, and photography. Um, but uh, it allows me then to form connections, which most people within an academic background are not free to do. And that's why 
most academics find people like me very irritable because they have to say what they're allowed to say within this box. Yeah, My box is much bigger. I can go that way. I don't have to be beholden to someone with a lot of money or uh, uh, um, a, a dog knowledge or anything that holds me to within a certain paradigm. So that's my education. My education comes from being in the field, connecting to people who've done a lot of research in these things, adding my perspective and seeing how these things come together. And usually they do. Uh, and if they don't, you throw them out or you right. find a hypothesis that takes you elsewhere. So that's where my background really comes from. It's just free thinking and association. Yeah. Well, you and I have that in common. I left the school school in the ninth grade and traveled the world looking for the best experts and every topic I thought was relevant to anything to do with human physiology, function, spiritual development, et cetera, and built my institute based on exactly the same concepts as you and have certainly <laughs> ruffled many feathers in the That's academic good. circles in my career. <laughs> and if you weren't doing that, you weren't doing a job properly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And it's not that they're wrong. It's just that they are really trying to shape uh, the view of history from a very narrow point of view, usually based on pottery shards. And then there's nothing wrong with that. It's nice to go and dig things up and dig up the past. But you can't judge an entire civilization based on a few pieces of rubbish. It's just right. not sensible. And no. that's why we get on their nerves, because we can say, well, actually, you forgot about folklore, mythology, geology, astronomy, uh, archaeoastronomy, uh, and other things. And when you have that toolbox to work with, you're actually much closer to what was going on in the deep past. So it's not that we despise these people. We don't. Uh, it's, they think that we do. It's just that they're very jealous that we're getting all the attention, because Somehow we've rung a bell, and the bell, you know, the uh, truth has a ring to it. Yes, and it I does. think we are getting closer to the truth of what was really taking place a long time ago. Yes, and I'm excited to ask you some questions about that. You know, uh, Freddie, you're a hard guy to do an interview with because I could actually <laughs> put together about a 5,000 page list of questions and dialogue points. So, having oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say having an hour with you is kind of like uh, having five minutes to make love to Madonna or something. Uh, <laughs> it'd, be like, it'd be like having a conversation with your pub at the uncle, uh, sorry, it, with your uncle at the pub. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, it wouldn't be a pub. We'd be smoking a a, a big bag of vaporized pot and herbs or something. <laughs> um, we, just, we just did that in Egypt two weeks ago. Right on. Freddie, we're all aware of the concept of the universe or the one song, as the word means, and many believe there's nothing outside our universe. But we also have people like Nassim Harriman suggesting that protons escape our universe to inflate into new universes. Then there are the string theorists like Misho Kaku, John Gribben, and others that speak of a multiverse and describe the universe or the multiverse as all there is. Then in we have others such as the engineer, healer, and channeler Guy Needler that speak of an omniverse, which he defines as the origin, absolute, the all, is a vast amorphic track of sentient energetic space with no boundaries. That's what he calls the omniverse. I'm curious as to your opinion regarding which of these concepts is most in alignment with your own experience and research. God, there's a lot of adjectives in that phrase, isn't it? Yeah, well. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's a funny thing, isn't it? We're all struggling to identify and quantify the unknowable. Uh, and we get into these really convoluted ideas. And all of them, I think, are very, very valuable, by the way. Yeah. Um, I just tend to go with what the ancients were doing because they were closer to nature than we are. And I yes. think their language is much more direct. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why ayahuasca is so in, um, you know, in, in the vogue right now. Yeah. Although having spoken to many shamans in Central and South America, they're saying, actually, that's kind of a vehicle. It's not really the experience of the other world. They just call it the other world. That's it. Mm -hmm. The umduat, the Egyptians called it. And in their understanding, it's all happening simultaneously. And it's yes. absolutely parallel with this physical world. The problem is it's out of time with our world because time is our linear concept of how to keep things in our brain and also our cell phone. Otherwise, we can't function in a 3D environment. But they already understood that to try and quantify and put adjectives, verbs, and nouns to quantify what's not in the visible um, uh, construct of our universe is pointless because there is nothing that we have that approximates it. 
Right. And I kind of like that. For them, it was the experience of the all that there is, the now, because everything happens simultaneously. And I was actually privy to one channel session with a group that I work in England. And I can say that the work, the stuff that we, uh, sorry, I should uh, clarify this. Our fearless, glorious leader, who is one of the most exceptional, talented psychics I've ever met, uh, the information that comes through her is 100% genuine. Uh, we can back this up actually with quantifiable information. Um, so one of the things that we found out was that um, we, we had a chance to actually ask this question of whoever was coming through. And they said, well, you really shouldn't spend much time trying to figure out this in numbers or words because there is nothing in human uh, understanding that will explain what's happening out here. It's beyond uh, it's beyond your ability. And it didn't say your limited ability. It's, a, it's beyond your ability to understand, given your limitations. Right. Uh, just accept that it's much more complicated. There are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of universes out there, and they're all interconnected. They're all holographic. They're all happening at the same time. And just thinking about that gives you a blinding headache. And that's why they were saying, Try not to even think about it uh, and intellectualize it. Just try to experience it. And uh, this is why it was very important for initiates in the old days to have this in induced near-death experience, uh, which is called the initiation ceremony uh, or the resurrection ceremony, as they also used to call it around the Christian era. And it has nothing to do with people being nailed to a cross, by the way, um, where they actually physically left the body, went walk about in the other world to try to understand how it works. And people like Plato, Pythagoras, who couldn't get enough of this, he did it five times, um, they were very much into accessing this pure existence, just uh, that, that they call the now, mm -hmm. in order to try and bring back some understanding of how the universe functions, so that paradoxically, they could intellectualize it and explain it to us. And I think Plato did it very well. Pythagoras did it very well. The other Greek uh, historians also tried to make an effort on how, how to actually demonstrate that. Uh, the Egyptians, of course, used parables and allegories and metaphors in which to understand this. And the closest we have today are the Zen paradoxes of the Far East. So again, it's a it's an intellectual process for us, but it really still does not approximate the true reality of what's really out there. It's much more complicated. Yeah, I find Plotinus's teachings very rewarding and on many levels, including those issues. Exactly, and uh, like I said, I mean, this was the, this uh, his experience was an induced near death experience. It wasn't a voluntary thing, uh, and it was very dangerous. I mean, you could actually not come back into the body. Uh, so for him to have done it five times is exceptional. Uh, he was a real out of body junkie, apparently. Yeah, you you probably don't know this, but I'm a medicine man and spirit guide, and I've conducted over 400 healing ceremonies with plant medicines, and have uh, plenty of experience with that, as well yeah. as working with a tai chi master I, I did daily tai chi for over 17 years so i've i've had uh, a lot of experiences crossing over myself I, I sometimes i'm just marveled that i'm even here because there's been times where i'm like i am completely and utterly gone and i have no idea who i am or what i am right now but <laughs> i'm glad i'm back <laughs> And then you're really disappointed that they allowed you to come back. It's like, but it was so much fun over there. There was no pain. And look at the color of the music. And uh -huh. everything's free. There's no mortgages to pay. It's like, and then they throw you back again. Well, you know, your job isn't done. Back you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's okay. I, uh, I've i got a, a five-year-old, a 19-month-old, and a 41-year-old, and just became a grandpa. So when uh -huh. I've when I've had these experiences of being on the other side, the first thing that happens is I feel the pain of them not being ready for me to go. And I think that's what pulls me back. Exactly. Yeah. You know, Freddie, you speak extensively and lucidly about a wide variety of native and ancient cultures with tremendous commonalities in how they describe events on earth, gods of extraterrestrial origin, building temples, sacred sites, portals on earth, and how they come to help humanity in times of crisis. Then there's the concept of man as a product of race mixing with gods, DNA modifications, and the likes. This leads me to a series of related questions I've been chomping at the bit to ask you. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know if you saw my outline, but I'll just take them one at a time so we don't get so many that it's hard for you to really focus on any one of them. The first question in this regard is, are you and others in your field implying that the gods incarnated here in physical bodies, or did 
or do these gods arrive here as we'd expect extraterrestrial beings to arrive in some sort of ship or other means of travel or trans or a transport beam for interdimensional travel and or are they, they or are they beings being perceived through the perceptual range of maybe inner vision or like we would work on the astral level uh, so I'm just curious, or is it a combination of all the above? Um, well, it's not an opinion. It's an actual description by the people themselves. That's why I was trying. I, I tried to get out of the situation whenever I'm writing about anything. It's not about me. It's about other things. And uh, the one thing that I did find common to every single surviving indigenous culture in the world is that they're very adamant that the gods were very much real people. Uh -huh. uh, they were human-like, but not quite human was the phrase I kept picking up again and again uh, they were very tall uh, they're even taller than me if that's possible uh, about eight and a half feet tall uh, sometimes elongated skulls redhead with green eyes or blonde with blue eyes and they always said this is always weird in the pacific for example they were very light skinned and they always had to rub anointment on their skin because they obviously had a problem with the sun uh, yeah. Kind of like we do with, you know, like in San Diego, with uh, to protect your skin from uh, from the sun. Yeah. And uh, th that's why they were nicknamed the Shining Ones, wherever they went around the world. And also because the metaphor was also a description of their in intellect as well, which gave them a sort of, you know, celestial shining experience. So for them, they were very real. And um, you also have to understand the concept of gods. Uh, it's not as we have come to believe in the Western tradition, some white guy with a beard sitting on a throne dispensing all kind of uh, doom and gloom. A god back then was an element of nature. It was a spirit in any natural form. So a water has a god, a plant has a god, uh, mm -hmm. the computer has a god, and so forth. Yes. And any person in a physical form that understands that, encapsulates it, and tries to control that energy becomes as a god. So mm. this is where we go completely wrong. And there's always trolls on Facebook giving me a hard time about this, but they have no concept of what the ancestors really were discussing when they were describing the gods. So these people, first of all, were very real. Uh, they certainly lived in a parallel civilization at least 12,000 years ago because they were the ones who were bailing us out after the flood. And if it, if it wasn't for them, we would not be having this conversation right now. Right. Uh, the planet would have been run over by 14-foot-tall, red-haired giants uh, who were cannibals and not very nice people. Uh, they, were, they were the sort of a, a bad genetic mix between a small little group of people who were connected. They're like the craftspeople that surrounded the main group of gods and they decided to uh, go and hang out with human women which they were told not to and from those uh, uh, liaisons the, this group of very unusual misfits was born and they kept breeding and breeding and so the gods had to basically say right we're going to have to induce a flood here and wipe out everything otherwise humanity is not going to survive so my other question was well where did they come from you know and now we're going deep into antiquity and that was the hardest thing to pin down but the more i traveled through south america and polynesia and through africa and i kept collecting the stories because you know folklore and myth are wonderful vehicles for conveying very important information they're theatrical devices and it makes you remember the stories much more than me saying to you, hey, guess what I had a chat with last week at the pub? Right. So like, oh, great. Uh, that's going to get um, forgotten over time. So these are devices that help you remember actual eyewitness accounts. Mm -hmm. And every single time, Orion pops up into the story. Uh, in fact, I just released a documentary on this. And... Um, they talk about how in the past, the gods could travel from here to Orion as easy as you and I go shopping for a can of beans at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it involved uh, the movement of matter within the self. It involved the transmission of the self in a special building like a pyramid or sitting on a special metal throne, uh, which in Egypt they called a bja. And we have no idea what that word means. So some kind of uh, metal that helped them go from A to B. Right. And also sometimes in, in structural craft as well, like uh, Native America has a lot of connections with the uh, flying shields, they call them, that could go from here to there. And what they also said is that once in a while, these uh, uh, gods would take a lucky human with them to the belt stars of Orion, which seems to be the junction box of the entire universe. It's like you go from here to the belt stars, and from there you can go boom, everywhere else. Uh, and that I'm still working on. Uh, collecting that information is very, very uh, time-consuming. But certainly the belt of Orion 
always comes up in the story. The Maya go as far as say that it's a triangle of the three of the main stars in the uh, constellation, at the center of which is the M42 nebula, which NASA actually agrees is a very unusual part of the sky. It's like a star forming region with all kinds of radio uh, bursts coming out of it. And they're saying that this was the, the point of creation, not just of knowledge and of the gods, but of humans as well. And I thought that was an astonishing uh, assumption. But I found the same story also in the Middle East. So it's not just one group of people saying it, it's many. So we have to rethink our concept of extraterrestrial in that uh, sense. Not little green men, but actually humanoid people living somewhere else that a long time ago had the impulse to be here on Earth as well and also establish a long living civilization. Now, how far back this goes to and how what possessed them to come here in the first place, now that we don't know. It's purely open to speculation because the story now is 100,000 years old. We don't have a record of any of this unless the Aboriginal people in Australia can help us, and I'm sure they will. You know, uh, Alan Watts says something interesting that triggers a question in me for you in this regard. Alan Watts says the universe is a peopling universe. (laughs) I'm curious as to your thoughts. Do you find through your researches that the human form is populated throughout the galaxy or the universe? Or are we strictly here on Earth? And I'm curious as to what you think the origin of humanity is. Are we an experiment or are what do you, what's your view on that? Oh, I think if we follow the basic caveat that uh, all form follows function, I think that every single star star system, every point in the universe has its own particular life form. And I would not uh, be, I don't think it would be too much to ask that there are people just like us living somewhere else. I mean, there must be other Earth type stars, uh, planets in other star systems elsewhere. I don't think that would be an anomaly. I think that'd be quite common. And the fact that we also had these gods who came down here that for all intents and purposes appear to be the um, the basis of Caucasian uh, people and certainly Nordic people, uh, because that's where they uh, essentially come from, from the lords of Anu who lived in Mesopotamia. That's how they were described. And if you took out the lords of Anu and described these people, you'd think you're talking about Norwegians mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, or red-headed Irish people, because that's right. another, their trait. And you have the same story in Polynesia as well. So, Obviously, there must have been physical people that look just like us, which comes back to what the uh, indigenous people keep saying, that these people, these gods were human-like, but not quite human. So Mm -hmm. where they come from must have been also very supportive of a human-like environment. That's why they look kind of like us, but yet slightly different because they're they're the product of something else. And then when they were here, carrying on a parallel culture to ours, when when we were just hunter-gatherers, when they tried to interact with human women, uh, all kinds of problems came up. And in fact, the Wichita of Oklahoma still have a story when they said, yes, in the days of old, when the uh, tall people used to come to the tribe and take a wife, um, uh, the wife would give birth. She would die giving birth because she gave birth to an infant because the two DNA just weren't compatible. And uh, looking at the story of um, some of the earliest Sumerian texts, uh, it's quite clear that they were struggling, uh, especially after the flood when those few people that survived, that the gods were struggling to basically interbreed and they were running out of people and they said well either we die because we can't keep interbreeding because that creates all problems in mitochondrial dna we have to find a way to make with human beings and that's where the egyptians come up with this great line the half human half divine bloodline after the flood that reigned for at least let's see five thousand years before and i quote the first pharaoh of a purely human bloodline takes the throne in 3100 bc so they obviously survived. Uh, this is why we get these unusual people like Akhenaten and his father, Amenhotep III. They were the last of that bloodline in Egypt. And you can still see the physiognomy that goes back to the time of the gods. And it wasn't working out too well by then either. So the other uh, point of the story is, are humans a construct of some experiment? Now this is where you get into some dodgy territory because we have the Sumerian tablets to go by. We have Zechariah Sitchin's uh, part examination of this, and we now also know that he didn't quite get it right. He didn't get it all wrong. He didn't quite get it all right. 
That was the problem. He kept uh, distorting the translation of ancient Sumerian, which we now know wasn't quite correct. But to give him credit, it was also mostly correct. So if you look at the tablets that were deciphered, it does show that there was some kind of uh, mixing going on in this place called Garsad, which is where the Lords of Anu used to be, which is uh, on top of a very high mountain somewhere in northern Mesopotamia. We don't quite know where it is. And I tried in the, when I was writing The Missing Land to try and figure out where it was, and I'm still approximating it. So you do get these moments in these clay tablets that clearly show that there's some kind of genetic experimentation going with the human line and the line of the gods. And that's where I believe we get this concept of half human, half divine, that we built, they were, we were created in their image. And even there was a, a, an unfortunate um, artifact in the Bible that they tried to cover up so much of the original teachings, but they had these grammatical errors and also little bits of information that reveal the fact that the first initial tablets do talk about the fact that there was us, the gods, not a god, but lots of gods, and let's make uh, humans uh, or the red man, as the, as humans were called back then, in our image. So there is some uh, suggestion that there was also this time, and particularly after the flood, where humans all and, and uh, gods had to find a way to interbreed together. And I do believe that there is a suggestion that they were, they were uh, aiming for this effort and they eventually succeeded to a certain degree. Yeah, a couple of things come up. One that makes me think of the Arabic meaning of Adam, which is Adamus, creature of red earth, of earthly yeah. slime. Um, so one of the things I, I was watching your series on the Templars last night, and you talked about how port, half a port or a third of Portugal was given to the Templars, but there was discussion of protecting a bloodline, but you never mentioned what the bloodline was. Are these bloodlines you're talking about in that context, the extension of these extraterrestrials or beings from other dimensions that we're calling gods that mixed with us? Is that the bloodlines you're talking about? Yeah, it goes back to... Um what uh, Michael Bajant and Henry uh, uh, Lincoln and uh, the other gentleman, I can't remember his name, Mike Lee, and also uh, Lawrence Gardner, the late Lawrence Gardner, they were looking into this information and they had a very good uh, detailed documentation to back it up that all of these uh, uh, divine bloodlines, the royal bloodlines, really go back to the lords of Anu, who we call the Anunnaki, who unfortunately always get such a negative uh, wrap wherever you go. And it's just a, a, an artifact of very bad research. I'm sorry to say this. And in the missing lands, I try to rehabilitate these people because you've got to read the story carefully and properly and in time and in context. And the Anunnaki were actually our assistants. In fact, without their intervention, we would be in deep trouble. Really, really were in deep trouble. We owe them a modicum of gratitude for what they were doing. So they traced the story all the way back to Mesopotamia and Egypt for the uh, for the bloodlines because their ability to do what they did in terms of harnessing the laws of nature and to a certain degree bend the rules of nature literally was in the blood itself. Uh, it was a certain type of ability that they carried, and that's why they had to keep the, the bloodline very pure. They had to interbreed. Once you start interbreeding with humans, the diffusion goes away. By the time you get to the historical era now they're so interbred we don't know who's who right. but the templars were making a very good point about this because and once you understand who the templars were and that how they were connected to the cistercian order and how those two orders also work with the third group called the uh how, um the order of scion not the priory it's a completely different thing altogether uh with the order of scion they were very adamant about maintaining the Western tradition of this bloodline, which went back to Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and of course, all of their offspring. So when I was researching the Templar book, I was uh, reading this uh, 17th century uh, book, which is literally written on animal skin by, uh, by hand by a monk, 638 pages. And I mean, it was this thing is this big. I mean, I had to go to Harvard to pick this thing up. Uh, they wouldn't, of course, let me leave the building without it. So somewhere on page 580, because they didn't believe in indexes back then, uh, I found something quite by accident that I wasn't really looking for. And it talks about the Templar swearing in ceremony uh, to protect the bloodline of David. And I thought, my God, what's that doing in a swearing in ceremony? And especially in Portugal. And I always um, argued that, uh, you know, when Mary Magdalene left 
and she split up with Jesus so they can go in their opposite direction because the church was after them. Uh, everyone was after them that was in the religious institution. So they split themselves up to save the day. That makes a lot of sense. So Jesus apparently dies of old age in Kashmir. Mary Magdalene goes off to France. Uh, there is a record of her actually landing there. There's a record of her going to South Central France and then boom, disappears. And I always argued that if they had three to four children, uh, which we have at least three of the names, then like a good bank account, you don't keep the, your, your deposit in one place. You split the bank account up. And some allegedly went to Scotland, if you follow that uh, uh, theory. And the other one apparently ends up in Portugal. And there was also part of the uh, bloodline, which was also protected by the House of Avis in Portugal, which I didn't even get to in the book. It was really a 15-year piece of work, and I just uh, it did my head in that book, and it was so complex that I figured I better stop there. But I did have a very good friend in America who is uh, one of the heads of the Eastern Star, which is like the, free, uh, the female Masonic movement in America. And she asked me when she was going to her conclave in Belgium a few years ago, is there anything you want me to ask while I'm there? And I said, well, could you ask the uh, the Masons whether I'm, I was on the right track? Because it wasn't part of my book to look for the bloodline. It just happened to cross paths with it in the course of research. And she says, okay, I think I'll do that. Comes back a couple of weeks later, and she says, I had a very, very unusual response. And uh, they said, it went very quiet when she came up with the, uh, the question. And, and the guy says to her, just tell your friend politely that uh, sometimes uh, you stick your nose too deep into the honeypot for your own good. Let's just leave it at that. So the impression that I got is that, yes, I did stumble upon a bloodline that still survives in Portugal somewhere. And apparently they don't even know who they are. They, their secrecy has been protected for their own good. Right. Because the church would literally wipe them out if they knew who they were. And this was brought up in Lincoln, Lee, and uh, Beijing's book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail as well. So I do believe that there is another similar to the bloodline there and that, that it survived. As to their abilities, I don't think that they still have them because of the amount of interbreeding over thousands of years. You can't expect them to have, to have the same powers, but they still do symbolically link back to the lords of Anu and the followers of Horus in Egypt and all of the people that carry different names but belong to the same group of gods 12,000 years ago. Well, in your your uh, documentary on the Templars, you, you made a comment. You said that uh, because of the the bloodline had to be protected and kept secret, or the Vatican or the Church—I can't remember which word you used—would wipe them out. Uh, my question is, why is the Vatican and the Church so afraid of these bloodlines? Oh, it's very simple. Uh, it's because the the whole Catholic Church is founded on a bunch of lies. Right. I mean, first of all, they wiped out, and this is the, the thing that surprised me, and I, I researched this in depth. I wanted to know why the early Gnostic Christians were being butchered by the fundamentalist Christians. That didn't make any sense to me. Well, it's simply because the Gnostics said, well, these are metaphors that you're passing off as real events. No one got physically nailed to a cross. No one physically got out from a sepulcher after physically dying. They're metaphors. They're the language of initiation. And anyone in the world, even in Native America, understood this. Uh, even today, uh, these concepts of allegories and metaphors for the resurrection of the soul while you're still alive. But because there was a bunch of guys, and it's always a small group of guys who are the trouble, they wanted to establish a religion because the uh, when the vacuum of Rome fell apart, it left this hole in Europe. So, of course, you've got a few million people in Europe that need to be told what to do. So how do we do this? We invent a religion on the back of something else. So the Gnostic Christians said that the uh, fundamentalist version of the story, which becomes the Catholic Church, was found on a complete lie, a complete distortion of the facts. And this is why the Catholic Church spent years, hundreds of years, wiping out everybody in order to make sure the real story didn't come out. So they falsified the documents that Peter had been the, the first bishop of Rome because they said that the whole basis of the church is because Peter was the first witness to Christ's miraculous resurrection. Well, he wasn't. Mary Magdalene was the first witness to Jesus' miraculous resurrection because she was the high priestess of the temple. He had gone for an initiation. He had been drugged. You take a poison to leave the body. And, of course, the high priestess has the antidote but all of this had nothing to do with the physical nailing of anyone to a cross. 
Even the Quran has the same story. So if it can be proved that there's a bloodline, a real bloodline that goes back with the divine source of gods, were very much real, and the uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were part of that bloodline, which according to the writers of the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, they were, then if they had offspring, that bloodline maintains, and that is the true church, okay? Not that they were creating a, a, a religion out of it, they never had that intention in the first place, it was about the teaching, which is important, it's not about the individual, it's the teaching, so everybody has the teaching, and then they can raise their inner self to the level of God. So the church couldn't have this. So in order to make sure that their presence and their establishment was remained well-founded and funded, they basically destroyed the connection to the bloodline by supporting the Carolingian uh, family over the Merovingians, which were the, cre the carriers of the bloodline in the early dark ages of Europe. So they're the ones that trace their story back to Sumeria. So the Carolingians eventually won, and the Merovingians had to go underground, and it remains so to this day. So that's why they basically want to make sure that the story doesn't come out, and also why they spent $13 million debunking Dan Brown's fictional accounts of the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, because most of his book, The Da Vinci Code, is mostly loosely based on that book. Uh, it's a work of fiction, of course. It's a very good book. But why would the church spend $13 million debunking a fictional book? It's almost like putting a parental sticker on a CD and saying, don't buy this. Yeah. There's important information here. And, of course, the cat's out of the bag by then. Because, uh, And then when the lawyers of Holy Blood, Holy Grail sued Dan Brown, knowing they were not going to win, by the way, uh, you can't plagiarize from a factional book to a fictional book. You, you're using one for reference. And most, most people do that. So they basically were drawing attention to this book that had, got, had been forgotten for quite some time. And of course, people began to ask questions. Where did Dan Brown get his information from? Oh, it's this book that came out 30 years earlier. Well, that's interesting. That's why they were, the church spent so much time debunking the Da Vinci Code, you see. So this is real life, uh, real life conspiracy theory that's going on here, baby, you know, literally in front of our eyes. But it goes back to the time that we were working out with these people called the gods who had this incredible ability. And what did they do with this ability? Nothing more than just teach ordinary hunter-gatherers like us. You can be just like us. All you have to do is learn these teachings, learn the ability to understand nature, uh, spiritualize yourself, learn some rules of proper behavior, and this is how you take control of yourself and your manifestation process. That's what's so dangerous to organize religion. You're in control, not a bunch of guys wearing frogs with little red shoes. A uh, whole great spirit. I say amen to that one. <laughs> Paradoxically, yes. <laughs> my, By the, my... way, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, is actually uh, completely ripped off from an Egyptian prayer called Amun Amun Hamun, who resides in the sky. Glorious is your name. Your kingdom will appear here on earth. Boom. They just change the words a little bit. Of course, very, very Christian thing to do. And very few people realize that when they end a prayer with Amen, they're actually both saying Amun. thank you to Amun Ra. <laughs> exactly, Amun. <laughs> I always, funny. I love it. Hi, everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, <laughs> unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, and unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah! I love Organifi's high values and high quality products and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. 
If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic, super clean, nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 on checkout. That's CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that Different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by optimizers products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living 40 and put in your coupon code Paul 10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their Organic Longevity Formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. My next question comes to you based on my studies of the Law of One series by Ra. Uh, You must be familiar with that series. I'm familiar with it. I've never actually delved into it, uh, given the amount of reading material that I have. Yeah, I I have. I have, and I found it to be quite fascinating. And when I asked my soul, is this authentic enough for me to, you know, put my effort into, I got a very strong yes. But in the Law of One, Ross states that the temples were not built in the way we typically perceive things to be built but that they are thought forms manifest in the physical. In other words, they describe, Ra describes that they have the ability as six six density entities to focus their energy into any thought form and manifest it in material form. And they said that they left a few confusing uh, objects around to make it look like somebody built them because they said that humans would not be able to comprehend how they were actually built. Um, So I was just curious what your thoughts were regarding that concept, because it seems quite possible to me, especially having studied the mind quite extensively. I mean, when you think, okay, when we want to build a house, we have an idea in our head, we draw it down, we make plans, and then we bring the material to manifest it. But if you think, okay, well, if there's beings with the power to travel interdimensionally, then they certainly would 
it would not be unlikely at all that they could manifest a temple. So I was just curious because you've spent your whole life in this area. I wonder what your thoughts on the potential validity of that concept is. Well, I mean, you get people in, in South America and uh, Polynesia, Far East and uh, the Middle East that talk about the same thing, how the temples were built overnight to the sound of vocal command or sounds. And right. the stones moved literally from there to here. The whole thing was built in literally in the blink of a night over the course of a night. Uh, you know, you'd be sitting out there with your sheep, uh, you know, having a little smoke and a cognac. And next thing you know, you wake up in the morning, there's an entire city built up. And now that would have been an anomaly if someone just mentioned it once. But when it gets talked about again and again and again in different parts of the world, now you have to wonder whether perhaps these are not eyewitness accounts. Uh, the best surviving source for this actually is a book that's very rare. Uh, it's about $500 if you can get your hands on it. And it's called The, uh, uh, the Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple. And it's an academic book. Um, this wonderful woman called the uh, uh, Eve Raymond, the late Eve Raymond, she basically translated the Edfu building texts, which are right in front of you. You go to Edfu, they're all over the walls. She's not applied any judgment. She's just translated what they say. Now, I'm reading this for the sixth time because it's slow, dense, and you've got to understand metaphor and the power of symbol here to see what's going on. And it makes a lot of sense. They actually tell you how to build temples, and it talks about how the gods literally were able to uh, infuse with power any substances, substance that they would look at or they, would, they could think of. So all you have to do is apply the thought form to this cup, and the cup is suddenly there. Uh, they could actually transmute the laws of nature, that they had complete control of the laws of nature. But in order to create a temple, they also have to do sacred measure, which is based on a, uh, an actual unit of measure of the atom. I don't know how they figure this out, but you can actually uh, follow the trail back to this. And also how to disperse negative energy, anchor positive energy to the spot, which they call the, uh, the serpent, of course, and then establish the sacred mound upon which is infused the energy of the gods. So there's a lot of uh, directed uh, intent. This is how we describe it. We apply directed intent into a specific area in order to form the foundation of an energy form. The rest are just rocks, you know, just to hold the energy together. Uh, so this is the closest I've come to find that there is an overlap of the story. Uh, because we're now talking uh, only 12,000 years ago. We don't know how old this stuff is. But I imagine if you keep projecting this idea further and further back, and the fact that the gods said that they could take on human form whenever they wanted to, it would suggest to me that, yes, they had such a complete control over the atomic structure of the universe that they could do things at will. They could be in two places at once, uh, just like the, the Maya said. Yes, they could travel without moving. They could see far without moving. They could project into the future and find out what was happening 10,000 years from now. They had these incredible abilities. So it's, again, the power of thought. And we're getting close to understanding how this works. I mean, there's been experiments at Princeton, for example, that show the power of intent when you have several people in a room with the same focus on a particular object or a specific location. And sending that intent together to that location, it is registered on the other side of the world. So we're getting close to understanding that the physical world is actually quite rudimentary. And it's just a kind of a, a, a mental block to how we can actually create things. So I would not disagree with that thought at all. I think that we've slowly, over 12,000 years, forgot how to apply this basic information. And then we began to use big rocks in order to establish what we did. And then we try to recreate what the gods did. But now we're one um, step distance. We don't know how to apply the power of thought. We apply energy in the form of the type of rock, the type of energy that we anchor to the ground, the use of sound harmonics. And by the time you get to the Greek era, you're using little bricks and having to draw things on a piece of paper and you know employ architects to build them. So we're actually going backwards from the point of, of start from where the raw material really begins. Yeah. It's uh, very, you know, I'm a remote viewer and you just described exactly in principle how I do remote viewing. And that is, oh. <laughs> I simply hold my intention. So if I want to be on the sun or in the sun, I just simply say to my soul, take me to the sun. And I hold my intention on that single thought. Exactly. And then, and then in the, my third eye, I, I just appear there yeah. and I start walking around and 
you know, I, I could go into all sorts of interesting things about beings I've met all over the place, but uh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to sidetrack the interview, but uh, well, that's the, the practitioners of Kriya Yoga pretty much also do the same thing and say that yes. the same thing. You manipulate the energy body and visualize the energy body like a double sided, uh, sorry, uh, a double image tetrahedron spitting in opposite directions in order to then create the expanded body, which is your soul, essentially. Uh, once you get in touch with your soul and you leave this bit, now you're in total control, you can go anywhere. And in fact, I often point to a very simple experiment we do every single day. And that is between two and three in the morning, where are you? Most of you has gone somewhere else. You yeah. are having this incredible dream world with people you've never met, places you've never been to, and they're absolutely real. Now, your brain has no actual experience of those people or those locations. So how are you possibly able to have this incredible vision when you have no no record, no experience of it. The only yeah. explanation is that only a part of you is actually here at any given moment. And the two and three in the morning when the Earth's gravitational field is at its weakest where you're living is allows you a little tube called the Sipapu, by the way, in the Native American language, the Sipapu read, and you go and connect with the rest of your soul and you go walk about. So Let's just like like you mentioned, Paul. Yeah, when you can do that consciously every single moment of the day, you can take your project your consciousness, and you can be elsewhere because not all of you is here at the same moment. Only about thirty percent actually yeah. incarnates with your body at any given moment. Yes, very very interesting. As I said, I could talk to you for a long <laughs> time. Um, you know, Freddie, I read the majority of your book, The Divine Blueprint. I'm still working through a few sections, but I've probably got. 80% of it studied. And uh, it's called the Divine Blueprint Temples, Power Places, and the Global Plan to Shape the Human Soul. But what I found interesting is that you have an extensive discussion of multiple, uh, you know, mel there's multiple mentions of the soul, but I could not find any def definitions of soul or spirit in the book. I'm wondering if you could share how you define soul or spirit. Ah, uh, it's in the details. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm yeah. asking you to unveil it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's like there's like a book hidden in between the book. Uh, I yeah. didn't realize it at the time. Uh, I don't want to lead people down a certain garden path. I want to uh, create a framework where people can walk into this labyrinth and find out the uh, truth for themselves. Otherwise, you're just reading my truth. My truth is not your truth because mm -hmm. I'm here on an individual journey. So I didn't want to quantify and qualify what a soul is to leave it up to you to read the information and then come to your own conclusion in the manner that you find acceptable. I find that much more open and much more self-possessing. So for me, the soul is essentially the uh, who I really am. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my spirit. It's my form, my aura, my energy my mm -hmm. essence uh i'm not sure i totally understand what it is yet i'm going you know like all of us we're here you know if, if we've incarnated we're not perfect we're still trying to understand who the hell we are yeah but i'm getting a sense through the experiences that i do and the things that i write and the people that i meet that i'm beginning to understand more of what who my soul actually is and who i truly am and it's bloody confusing because the problem is we've all incarnated trillions of times Mm -hmm. And we can only take with us, we only remember that much that we need right now in this experience. And that's why I find it very hard to describe what the soul is, because it really is limitless and it's timeless. And if I was to describe it, I would be describing maybe this much of it. And it still would be an approximation of the hugeness to what our soul really is. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why I kind of leave it for people to kind of find their own way because it makes them much more well it makes it much more comfortable and it's also much more rewarding that you're you're picking the information up for yourself yeah i asked my soul what what it is that a soul genuinely is and my soul said that a soul is an expression of the divine having a unique experience and spirit is the experience that you're having yeah I would uh, agree with that. In fact, there was a group of people. Well, I, I'll say I'll call them people because they're not incarnate. Uh, I'm sure they're very real on their level of reality. And they're on a level of reality, which there are no numbers to express. And they're saying that we have had so many experiences and so many incarnations beyond any calculation that we now just, well, we're kind of sitting around the Godhead um, guiding younger souls like you just one day you'll be sitting here too guiding other other souls as well that's all there is to do in the universe is to have the experience to which of course i asked so are you god this is well no we're not the creator 
can you see the creator? Well, we can. What is it? The whole room kind of moves in. Um, what is the creator? Well, it's light, it's love, it's everything and nothing. It's a, it's a paradox. So, well, if you're so close to it, then why don't you find out? And they said, well, because it would leave nothing else to figure out. <laughs> the one last thing. Yeah, I mean, so humble, isn't it? Yeah. They're sitting right there looking at the creator and they're saying, well, it's light, it's love, it's everything and nothing. It's a paradox. But we don't want to know what it is because it leaves us one final thing to try and work out. Otherwise, the moment we do inquire, boom, we join it and we dissolve into it. And we, be, we lose our entity, uh, identity. I thought that was a fun, incredible um, description of what's going on in the close realm of the creator. Yeah, I, I, the, the symbol I use to describe God to my students is zero. And I say zero is the only symbol that represents everything and no thing at the same time. And my students often say, well, how does God create something from nothing? And I say, you have the wrong concept. God doesn't create something from nothing. Yeah. God creates something from no thing. No In thing, other words, exactly. pure, pure <laughs> unadulterated potential or pure spirit is not a thing. That's already something that's informed. I say God creates something that you can perceive from that which had no border barrier or definition and therefore is not bound to space or time. Exactly. And we are bound by space and time, so our concept is working backwards. Yes. Oh, it's very difficult. In fact, it just reminded me that uh, one of my favorite films uh, from the 70s called um, Rollerball, uh, which is, a, 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 it was visionary, absolutely visionary film. The main computer into which the entire library of all Earth's knowledge was uh, books have basically been banned and uh, no one reads books anymore. This is back in the 70s, by the way, before cell phones. Yeah, no one has time to read books or anything. So we just put the, the entire sum of everything into this one computer. They call it zero. Well, they yeah. Know. Yes. And I he's think a I... malfunctioning creature. So it's like. Yes. You know. <laughs> I think I've actually seen that movie. You know, speaking of uh, nobody reading books anymore, one of my favorite sayings, and I don't know the source of it, but I, you may have heard it. It's a pretty damn good one. Never trust a person whose television is bigger than their bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you really like movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think you being my age get the point, though. Oh, I know, exactly. Uh, I think uh, it's kind of like some books. Uh, a lot of movies actually have the answers to all life's questions. Uh, there are some very frustrated philosophers writing great scripts for some fantastic movies. Not so much at the moment. Um, there seems to be much thinning out. The dialogue appears to be thinner and thinner as we get into the 21st century, but certainly some of the older movies, there are some incredible philosophical uh, discussions being done in dialogue between, you know, Cary Grant and, uh, you know, uh, Audrey Hepburn and things like that. If you just pay attention, it's all there. Kind of like Star Wars in a way. I mean, Star Wars is the classic example of Arthur and the Holy Grail or Jason and the Argonauts or the story of Osiris and Isis. You've just reshaped it in a space age theme for a modern audience. But the, the essence of what it is, it's all there. That's what makes it so incredible. It's interesting you brought up Aubrey Hepburn in this conversation because I have a favorite quote from her. She says, nothing is impossible. The word itself says I'm possible. Exactly. Um, fact, I just saw Breakfast at Tiffany last night. Uh, she's one of my heroes. I really admire her. I really do. Fantastic. Continuing on this line of thinking, um, I'm curious, you know, in, in the law of one, Ross says that human souls come in a cyclical process and that they have what they call a harvest and they give the the span of the harvest if i remember right it's been years since i read it but somewhere between 35 and 50,000 year cycles or something like that and then they said there's some kind of an event that results in what they call a harvest have you come across any concept like that where humans come to earth like a like a school where there's a period of time. Ross says in the harvest, any soul who is at least 51% loving is promoted to the next level of their development. And those that are 51% not are in what they call negative entities and they go a different path. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that concept of harvest and, and possibly uh, they say that the, the Milky Way galaxy is weighted 
51% toward love and that all the galaxies throughout the universe, universe are weighted slightly more toward love or slightly more toward what we would call the dark side or evil. And the reason for that is, is because consciousness has to have these polarities or it can't function. Exactly. So they describe even what we call evil beings as necessary beings because they are actually holders of the polarity. Exactly. So I'm it just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would say that's quite correct. I mean, you've got to have a, a disbalance in order to create movement of energy. You can't have 50-50. Nothing yeah. can work in a pure balance. Yes. Uh, you have to have that friction in order to create movement. Otherwise, nature would seem to function. Yes. Um, no, I, 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 I think that would be perfectly uh, feasible. Uh, and, I, and, of course, the, the ages that the Yugas talk about and the Maya talk about, they're very much connected to, I believe, this concept of what Ra would call the harvest, uh, the change of ages where suddenly everything starts falling into chaos, but in that chaos there's the level, the rise to another order already emblematic in that chaos and we're we're in the middle of this change right now i mean it feels like going, yeah we're all going about 2012 and if you talk to any mind they just rolled their eyes backwards and said no 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 nothing's going to happen in 2012 there's a window we're in the middle of the window of opportunity there's a 60-year window 30 years either side of course if you don't get it by 2042 we're going to be in deep uh, doo-doo they said, because the window's closing on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have to basically reach a level of awareness where a certain fraction, and no one knows what the fraction is, but uh, from what I've heard, it's not 51%. It's actually much less than that, almost like 32%, needs to think of a new positive change to another jump to order in order for that order to occur. And I think we're pretty close to it. Just from observing what I'm doing, uh, doing around the world, not the media, I'm mm -hmm. observing how people react around. Uh, what yes. I'm yes. And people doing good things don't attract attention in the media because it's, uh, uh, you know, good news doesn't create conflict. So right. no one's going to buy the newspapers. It's right. not because the media is evil. It's just because the media thrives on conflict in order to sell the story. Yeah. Because we're addicted to conflict. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of great things, good positive things happening around the world uh, right now. And I see that we are pretty close to hitting that critical mass. So, and within that, because we're also intertwined with nature, you also get the reverberation of a uh, clash of the light and the dark in climate as well. And each time there's been a major shift in consciousness, there have been either meteorites that fall out of the sky or plasma that comes out of the sun, burns everything to the crisp. And right now we're in the middle of a major uh, climate crisis. And we have, you know, essentially about, uh, what, 20 years to get through that critical mass that means that the change is going to happen anyway. It's how we ride the change that's very important. We have to ride it stoically, elegantly, and not fall into the fear. We lead by example. People will die and people will survive because that's the nature of the of Earth. Uh, it's always been that way. I mean, the Great Flood 12,000 years ago, even the gods died. He, a lot of humans died, but we're here and the gods are still surrounding us. And a few of them are still incarnated in physical form, guiding things along the side. They try not to attract too much attention to themselves, but this is how it's always been. And any physician who's listening in right now will agree with this. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, discipline of, of, um, of chaos uh, uh, theory. Yeah. So the greater the amount of chaos, the greater the potential jump to another level of order. So the more chaos we see right now, well, the potential jump to a new level of reality is incredible. So I'm actually glad that all of this chaos is happening because it means... We're doing our job properly as teachers, I think, I hope, that we're actually bringing questions to the table and people begin to question their reality, the uh, decisions that they've made, and also question themselves and how they are going to work with a new paradigm. So all is exactly where it needs to be right now. It's all part of a big change that happens very regularly on the face of the earth. Yeah. Uh, have you got time for one more question? Absolutely. I need a break. <laughs> ah, you need a break okay this is actually fun <laughs> yeah well i was hoping it would be fun for you you know I, I i really wanted it to not be a you know just another standard interview with the typical questions oh it never is i'm sure it isn't <laughs> yeah good you know while i was watching your documentary other world places of initiation and living resurrection which is fantastic for all of you listening it's very oh, good you. excellent uh, presentation on Gaia TV, and I know I think it's on Amazon as well. 
We don't talk but, about them. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, it's on it, my website. It's available. <laughs> um, you, you described the myth of Jesus was essentially repurposed by the Catholic Church, mentioning the 386 parallels to the myth of Krishna, as well as parallels to other myths. And I've personally read uh, a number of books on this topic, such as Christianity Before Christ, Cursey Graves, The World's 16 Crucified Saviors, and many others. Yeah. But what I found confusing in, in, the, in the documentary is then you referred to a scroll that actually talked of Jesus as an actual man. So what I wanted to do is ask you to unravel the mystery for me, because on one hand, you're saying what a lot of these other books say, that it's the recapitulation of a myth. But then on the other hand, you're quoting a scroll that says Jesus really lived. And a few minutes ago, you were talking about Jesus and Mary Magdalene as though there were people that went separate ways. So I need you to deconfuse me if you could. Oh, it's very simple. Uh, he was a real person. Uh, there's actual physical evidence to prove this. There's actually a wanted poster for Yeshua ben Yosef put pinned up by the Romans. And he, was <laughs> not a, he was not a very attractive guy. He was only about like five foot tall, slightly hunched back, uh, receding hairline, long greasy hair and a hooked nose, as people from that part of the world tend to look like. And Peter, who was quite tall, he had a, a hard time looking for Yeshua in a crowd because he was so short. So he's not the sort of, you know, Italian model that uh, would make him look at. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Certainly he's not a white an guy. Italian <laughs> model for God's sake. It doesn't seem to, to really confuse uh, Catholics when you talk them about this. He was not a white guy, for God's sake. Um, so, no, he was a real person. But there was also the myth of Jesus, and that was his, what he was practicing. Like I said, a myth is not a fictitious thing. A myth no. is a theatrical device which encompasses a spiritual truth. So Jesus the man lived, and he was practicing a tradition that was really by his time 8,000 years old, which uh, I, I actually wrote this uh, as an addendum to the Lost Art of Resurrection, the book upon which Other World is based, which talks about the Kujiki 72, which is the oldest spiritual book in Japan, which is dated around 8,000 BC, which actually has all the teachings called the way, which of course is what Jesus and the Essenes were practicing. Mm -hmm. They were masters of the way. So that moves from Japan all the way to the, uh, to the West, to the uh, Near East over 8,000 years. And it was also the same uh, mythology and spirituality practiced by Jesus' predecessor 6,000 years earlier called Mithras in the mm -hmm. Indus Valley. So you see, there are two things going on here. There's, right. uh, there's Jesus the man and there's Jesus the myth because the myth is a spiritual concept that Jesus himself was teaching. The trick is understanding what myth actually means. And not yeah. That. Well, one of my favorite interviews I did with was a, with a professor of religion and philosophy named James Carse. Are you familiar with James Carse? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm about to, I think. Well, I'll tell you what, if you look at his book, Finite and Infinite Games, it's a mind-bendingly good book. It's yeah. something, even with your mind, I think you'd be quite impressed. But he was also an expert in mythology, and he gave an excellent definition of myth. Myth is something that never happened, but is happening all the time. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if you strip the uh, the concept of the story of Isis and Osiris, for example, I mean, uh, it's in the back of my mind. I just came back from Egypt again. Uh, we to be having no issue with getting to Egypt during COVID, by the way. Uh, and we had it to ourselves. Um, I mean, if you look at the story of Isis and Osiris, and there are several versions of it, but the oldest one, really, when you disseminate it and all the numbers involved in the myth, it describes how the earth actually works. It describes the processional movement of the earth. It's the same thing with Jesus and the story of Peter and the fish. Uh, my mentor, the late John Michel, was uh, a genius at uncovering and unraveling these parables, which is part of myth. And he was saying, you know, uh, Freddie, it's interesting that when you look at the story of Peter and he's throwing a net into the Sea of Galilee on the left-hand side and he doesn't catch any fish. Meanwhile, Jesus shows up with his apostles on the Sea of Galilee and says, yo, Peter, uh, throw the, uh, the net on the right-hand side. You'll find your fish will be uh, multiplied many times. So he does it. And you think, well, what the hell does it matter throwing the net on the left or the right-hand side of the boat? And suddenly he gets 143 fish. Well, from that, John Michel went on to extrapolate an extraordinary diagram that tells you how the earth works. And that's just from a parable. And that's why myth and parable and allegory is so important in, these, in, these, uh, in life, because 
for the curious, and this is why it was done. It was to conceal important information from the devious and the curious who are interested in finding out more about the story. It gets their attention when they look at an anomaly and go, wait a minute, that means something else. Boom. That's how they used to suck you into the initiatory schools, the mystery schools. And then people who knew about the origin of symbol and the language of symbol would then say, well, if you want to know more about the story, you've got to understand what the symbol in the story means. And that's how you unravel the truth of how the universe works. And that's how it's always been done. So when we look at Jason and the Argonauts, it's the same retelling of the same story for a different audience. Arthur and the Grail, it's the same thing. It's full of astronomical and natural logical information if you are just curious to delve into it. Yeah. uh, You know, what rose inside of me when you were talking about that casting the net on the left versus the right was that the human brain is the trend the, the, the two-way radio station that the soul works through and the left side of the boat could represent the left brain and the right side the right brain exactly exactly i think john was just uh chipping at the uh the iceberg here i think yeah. there's more layers and layers of information because again everything is holographic isn't it I mean, yes yeah an, an, uh, an expression of the earth uh which is an expression of something else i mean yeah uh, for example when we go to the ben pyramid in egypt i mean the ben pyramid is a great example uh which basically condenses the earth and how it operates in space over twenty six thousand years the processional cycle and it's hardwired into the two angles. But at the same time, those two angles gives you a ratio, which is the same ratio found in the geometry that makes up human DNA. So the mm-hmm. building is essentially a mirror image of the human being and the planet that gave us birth. So all of these things can be quite unraveled. And, it, and they're so deadly simple. The paradox is it takes it almost a genius to try and figure it out what it means in the first place. The trick is, if you're curious, a door magically opens up in front of you and everything happens. These coincidences happen. People appear in front of you that didn't help you unravel the mystery. And before you know it, you're opening up your own spirituality to the biggest story. Speaking of doors opening, are you familiar with Ibrahim Karim, the founder of biogeometry? Oh, yeah. We shared an elevator once in Toronto. Well, he's a friend of mine. (laughs) He's actually a friend of mine. I've done two excellent podcasts, one with him and his daughter, Dorea and one with Dorea, and and him and I chat with each other and visit uh, over the web now and then. If you'd ever like to meet him, I'd love to put you in contact with him. He lives in Cairo, because I know you go to Egypt frequently. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, trust me, he's as deep as you are. <laughs> he's an interesting guy, and I've never had a chance to, I mean, my, the, my work has never had a chance to delve into his, but we have crossed paths just you know, just a, a quick hi, a quick pleasant hello at conferences and that. So, yeah. But, no, I forgot that he actually lives in Cairo. I think next time I'm there in October, I think. I mean, I have to spend an extra day going out for some coffee. Yeah, I'll I'll email a connection to the two of you, but I think you'd find my first podcast with him phenomenal. It's about oh, cool. three hours long or more. It's oh, very good. give me more to do. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, trust me, you'll it'll be worth your time. It's a I'll very it and this. I'll record it and listen to it on the plane over. It's the only time Ab- I get free yeah. to do anything nowadays. Uh, absolutely. But what I wanted to share with you is what really shocked me is that that's a probably one of my deepest podcasts. James Cars is another mind-bending one. Yeah. But within two weeks, that podcast had the most downloads of any podcast. Wow. And it was just skyrocketing because we talked about sensing the truth. I think people around the world sense the truth in his oh, words. I think, they do. I think they do. And so for a podcast of this deep, deep technical language of energy and shape and BG3 and negative green and, you know, concepts that most people are very unfamiliar with, for it to go viral like that was pretty impressive. Um, but I intuitively sensed that I should connect the two of you. So I'm glad I have the opportunity to do that. I know I don't want to stretch your, your time too much, but uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. (laughs) And uh, uh, is there anything you'd like to recommend uh, people to like your website or anything that you want to highlight before we say goodbye? 
Uh, just go to my website. It's the easiest thing. I, I like to do things simply because there's yeah. so much noise already. Uh, InvisibleTemple.com, uh, which is where you'll find my latest book, all the books, the documentaries, the DVDs, and lots of free stuff. So yes. that'll, that'll burn up a bit more of your personal time as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you've already, you know, <laughs> trust me. I, like I said to you in an email, if you walked into my house, my children would already know who you are because they've spent a lot of their life looking at your face on the television screen. Oh, my God, I, those poor children. Get them away from that television immediately. <laughs> well, you know what was really funny? <laughs> the other night, my 16-year-old, 16-month-old daughter I sat, she always sits on my lap for a foot rub and you were on the screen and she points at the screen and she goes, daddy, daddy. She thought you were me because we both have bald heads, I think. And so oh my she, God, I'm in deep trouble. I said, no, daddy's here. That's Freddie Silva. <laughs> oh my God. That paternity lawsuit's going to catch up with me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I get too deep in a shamanic journey and you get a little girl knocking at your door, you know what she thinks happened. <laughs> daddy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what do you Who want wants to know? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. What, what do you want? <laughs> oh, that would, that's pretty funny. <laughs> she'll just point to her feet and say "foot rub" because Daddy gives her foot rubs all the time. <laughs> it's all the right. action, Paul. It's the action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, sh- I think she'll take it. Um, Freddie, what? What? I just wanted to close by saying thank you for your work. I oh, love it. Paul. And I, I love sharing it with my students. I'm grateful to share it with the listeners. And I think that you really open up so many avenues that if nothing else happens to a person, unless they're dead, their imaginative creative faculty has to be just turned right on because the amount of evidence and the clarity and the unveiling of the symbology it's for a guy like me you know finding someone like you and and studying your works is like a rapid educational acceleration i mean oh spending time watching your stuff and reading your books is is really like saving someone 20 30 years of hard research you know <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it has I, to be entertaining too. I mean, it has. I mean, because sitting, especially in conferences, for example, where you have to sit down for a couple of hours looking at a guy going blah blah blah. Uh, I have the Pink Floyd principle where after two hours you don't realize I've even been there because there's 120 slides behind me. Yes, you've probably not paid attention to me, but you're hearing what I'm saying and you're looking at the screen. So it has to be engaging. It's the same thing with storytelling. Yes, it's the story, no matter how brilliant or how lucid or how um, mathematical it is, it has to be exciting. You have to put the reader in front of the book, inside the book. Uh, so I always write things so that in a way that I hope people will actually find it engaging and also theatrical. You know, it has, there's an element of humor as well. I play little tricks on people. If you're really watching, I yeah, I'm like throwing in words that haven't been used in 300 years that you have to go and look in the dictionary because yeah. we're losing so much of our language. And I like to do that to get people engaged. Get it puts them right next to me. You know, otherwise I'm just I'm just selling stuff. I don't want to do that. I no. want people to find their path. I want these things to open up people so that they can find their way, uh, not through me, but through themselves. Yes. Well. One of the things that I that I want to share, because I think it's important for the listeners to know about you, you, you know, having spent my whole career interacting with academically educated people, lecturing in various universities and academic institutions, one of the things that I really appreciate about your work is you've gone out and spoken to the natives in countries all over the world yeah. and got the folklore and, and got the myth and help de- get them to help you decode these messages. So what you're sharing in your books and programs actually, for me, has a lot more depth and a lot more truth to it because academics are usually just cut and pasting shit from other people, but yeah. they've never actually put their hands in the soil and been there and talked to the people. And so, you know, like a lot of academics is like Chinese whispers where one guy says one thing and then 10 years later, it's something completely different, but nobody's actually gone to the person who said it or exactly. the people that said it yet. They will, you know, jump up your ass if you tell them they're wrong and here's why. And so when I listen to you and you talk about, you know, this person you met in such and such a village and you talk to them and you talk to the natives, 
and this is what you unraveled, then I feel like I get to go on this journey with you and that I'm getting conveyed the wisdom of the elders and it's coming through you is sort of a vehicle to get it to us. And I think that's invaluable. So Yeah, because their predecessors were closer to the events than we are today. Totally. I mean, think about it. Uh, We're so far distant from what was going on. We're extrapolating uh, intellectually, which is okay, but it's not really what the um, event that took place was because these people live these events. They're, they're relating folklore because they're saying, you know, my great, 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 great predecessors were there. They were there in the flood. They did this. This happened. And we recorded this from person to person because we didn't want to forget the lesson. Right. And I think that's invaluable. And the Egyptians, of course, were a classic example. One of the priests that was talking to a Greek guy called Solon, uh, and this would have been about oh, 600 BC, um, he said, you know, we have recorded in our temples every notable event that's happened in the last 38,000 years. And you think, what? Yes. Because every time uh, something comes out of the sky, we have to start like children again. We built big temples with big rocks to make sure that the survivors wouldn't have to start off like children. Right. And now when you go back to Greece, you tell a guy called Plato that when he writes a story about Atlantis, we're the ones that he's copying from. Yeah. (laughs) And that's why Plato's story hits a nerve. You know, the academics hate that. But you know what? Plato wasn't the one that made up the story. He was basically getting information from Solon, who got it firsthand from one of the priests that said, yeah, this stuff is true. We're telling you because our civilization is is already on its uh, uh, closing stages. Your Greek civilization is coming to the fore. You need to pick up the trail. You need to take the bat on and you have to write it in a way that people remember. Boom. Plato says, yes, I think I'll fictionalize it in an account between two people, two statesmen, and we'll talk about the perfect state of Atlantis. And that's, there you have it. And the fact that the Egyptians gave Solon the exact same date for the fall of Atlantis as the Maya have for it on the other side of the world is, I believe, self-referencing. And that also came from eyewitness accounts. So, yeah, yeah, uh, listening to the uh, Aboriginal people, to the traditional people, we're doing them an honor because they are saving our ass because these events are going to happen again. And unless we don't listen to them and and their predecessors and what they have to tell us, uh, we can't intellectualize our way out of this dead end. We really can't. So uh, it's just like when uh, there was a group of archaeologists, I think they were archaeologists, and they were actually curious. And they said, you know, it's funny that the Aborigines talk about events that happened a million years ago. And we laugh at them. Well, let's go and find out. And they went to the outback. And uh, they said, you know, uh, there was, they, they remember this big rock of flames coming out of the sky, a meteorite. And they said it landed over there about a million years ago. And you know what? They actually went to this bowl-shaped depression. They dug eventually, and they found the last bit of the meteorite. And they said, well, how is it possible that human beings remember the event? There's no way anyone would have known this was a meteorite crater. It doesn't even look like a meteorite crater anymore. It's just that small bowl depression now. And it turns out that the Aborigines said, well, we told you we were much older than we were because, you know, you didn't want to believe us. You had to go and dig out the desert to find out that this was an eyewitness event. We recorded this. Luckily, we're a bit further away when it came down. So, yeah, yeah, I think we're beginning to wake up to the fact that we need to listen to our predecessors. They were much more smarter than we give them credit for. Yeah. Well, Freddie, what a blessing. Thank you very much. When you're new. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, when your new book comes out, if you want to do a podcast and talk about that and promote that, let me know. I'd love to get into that. Yeah, I'll have to escape to, I'm trying to escape to Scotland or uh, Donegal for a few weeks to write it. I'm, uh, I, I just can't seem to get away from so many distractions. I mean, like, like I said, even today, uh, one hour of just to sit down and do this uh, from so many things that are, are required of me at the moment. So I just want to get away and write, you know. Yeah, I live uh, with the a pint same. of Guinness as well. Yeah, you know? I, I live the same battle and i think it's i think it's fairly it's fairly kind of hand in hand it's almost like when you have something really important to do the universe puts all sorts of uh stickies around to pull you and you know you're like leave me alone i got work to do <laughs> i don't but, need to update my facebook page <laughs> yeah yeah well hopefully it wasn't too painful of an interruption for you and and no, this uh, is actually quite pleasant i can just sit down and breathe for a few minutes and talk yeah but, uh, the rest of the day is looking a bit weird <laughs> Oh, well, you know. I might even get a paragraph written. 
Yeah, well, you know, one paragraph from you can change somebody's life. So if that's what you get done today, it, it it's going to touch lives. And I'm very appreciative of all of your work. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. Well, that opening paragraph has to be killer. That's the most yeah. important thing. Yeah. It's the one that the whole book hangs on the first paragraph. So I've got to find some Guinness and uh, get into the, get into the rhythm of what this is going to be. It's going to be an interesting story. Uh, as always, it's going to be difficult, but somehow the gods will just come in and help. Or at least I hope they will. Of course they will. I'm not. They're not going to turn you down because at the core of your being, you and them are the same being. <laughs> they're only hurting themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, they're they're the parents, so they we, they have to parent us. We have to just make space in our busy minds to receive their subtle voices. Exactly. <laughs> All well, right. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Freddie. Lots of love. Thanks, Paul. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Freddie Silva. You can visit his website at invisibletemple.com to find out more about his books and films, to book a consultation, or to make a donation so he can continue his research and writing. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.